Hey, uh, new Airbnb, who this? Hey friends, this Airbnb property is a unique situation. It's not your normal coho deal. And that's why I wanna share it with you because a lot of you who don't even have a property yet could do a deal like this deal. And I normally say that you can't co-host without experience. No matter where you are, existing host or a newbie, you can do a deal like this because the way that this deal works is this is not a permanent Airbnb. And what I mean by that is the owner of this house is a contract nurse and she's going to be gone for six months. She got a last minute big contract and she just had to get out of here fast. And she had nothing to do with her property, no time to find a tenant. She's not gonna be gone long enough to put it on the long-term rental market, but she didn't just wanna eat her mortgage and not make any money on it. So she called me. This is something that anyone could do, but there are clear challenges to this type of co-hosting deal. Let's go over the pros and cons. And let me tell you, there are some strange things going on with this house, stuff that you might have to prepare for too, if you're going to make a property like this a success for six months. Let's get into it. Let me tell you what's going on in the kitchen. And first, what co-hosting is. In case you don't know yet, it's a way that you can Airbnb without owning a property and without renting it. It's higher risk for the owner because you're not guaranteeing them any money. You're telling the owner, I'm an expert at Airbnb, or at least I'm good enough to trust. Please give me your property and I'll give you the majority of the income and I'll take 20, 25% of the revenue. So if a landlord can trust you that you won't blow their property up and that you can make money worth their while, they can give you the property. But the owner also has to pay all the expenses, including the furniture. This is a high risk for a person who doesn't own furniture yet. So part of this hack is going all the way back to what Airbnb was about 10 years ago, finding a person with a property who has the extra space and all the furniture already and get that property on the market without a lot of barriers to entry. This property is already furnished because the owner lives here that makes this easy enough to get started. Now let's get to the pros and cons. One of the pros is the kitchen normally has everything it needs, like the pots and pans down there. She's got plenty, but since she is, I think a single woman, she doesn't have a lot of good cups. So one of the most important things that you can do when picking up a property like this is make sure that it has everything on your list of what a good property needs to have as a full property. This property can sleep eight or 10 people, we'll go over that in a second, which means you need to probably have 15 to 20 plates, 15 to 20 cups. I like having between 150 and 200% of things, depending on what they are, but I've got a spreadsheet for that, so I'm not gonna give you specifics, but you get the point. Another one of the pros is people tend to have nicer furniture in the homes that they live in. I think a lot of you who've ever stayed at an Airbnb that's run by an investor, maybe someone like me even, is you tend to find that these properties have on a budget furniture, which means there's not a lot of magic in there. Her table's nice, her couch is nice, stuff like that. She even has plants. This is a pro and a con, my friends, is these plants have to get watered. This is not normal for a regular Airbnb operator. Us at scale with over 100 properties, we would never have real plants, but now we have to put it into our turnover protocol every 15 days. These need to get watered and it's gonna be our job not to kill her plants over the six months that we're hosting for her. And yeah, I'm a bad plant dad in my normal life, so let's hope I can actually do a better job as a professional. This is something you have to be careful for. It will make itself obvious if you're checking at all, but all of the food, she kind of abandoned everything because she left so fast. That includes in the freezer and fridge. Now there are some things that I think you could keep because they make the home look good, but there's some stuff that has to go. Anything with a fast expiration date has to go within the next two or three months because housekeepers won't check these things. So you're gonna have to do a monthly food check. So I would recommend you only keep foods in here that have a shelf life of three months or four months or longer. Also anything open. Unfortunately, even if the stuff is good food, open bags do not come off as sanitary. They're likely not sanitary. You can't ask your guests to experience that. Unopened canned goods, unopened cereals maybe, uh, cereal bars, packets and stuff like that. Sure, go for it. But this is also too cluttered. Even if all this stuff was qualified, this still doesn't look good. We're gonna have to minimalize it so that way it can look organized. Same thing for the fridge. You can't have any fruits or vegetables or meats or dairy. Eggs is on the fence. And if you do provide eggs, you're going to have to like every week or two have your housekeeping staff check expiration dates and stuff. It's a lot to manage. So we prefer not to provide food. She asked us to provide this stuff to her first guests and even I'm on the fence about it. So that's one of the things that when somebody moves out, you're gonna have to clean this all out and you have to clear out the groceries all the way to actually clean everything because a dirty fridge is a dirty fridge and having food in there, you can miss that. As we go upstairs, let me tell you the crazy part of this story. This woman has pets. 
not only just pets, but multiple cats. And cats might be fine, but cats are highly allergenic. They can be dangerous. There's all sorts of cat memorabilia all over the place. And not only do we have to clean the place so that way there's no allergies in the home, but we have to remove any, any clues at all that there was ever a cat here ever, because that will scare a guest. Somebody who sees cat stuff will go, oh my God, this place is unsanitary. They'll probably try to get a refund. And also, since the homeowner is leaving a lot of her possessions here, we're coming up with locking systems to lock away some of her stuff. This is her master closet, and this is called a Python lock. Python lock is like a zip tie lock. And we also had to photograph everything in here in case anybody tries to break in, we can do an air cover claim for theft. We have to do the same thing with these bottom drawers here because she just didn't want to pack it all away. So another step for part-time Airbnb hosting is finding a way to secure people's belongings so they're confident enough to trust you with the place. And hopefully this Python lock works. I'll report later. This is the master bedroom. And overall it's fine. Even has a TV in the back, cool moose, but it's the only bedroom that really has anything in it. When we first talked about this property, she wanted to lock the master bedroom away and only use the guest rooms and sleep a max of four or five people in the home. And I told her that's a terrible idea for the property size. She could double her income by including the master and making some small modifications. I actually loaned this woman two queen beds in another room you're about to see because she did not have enough confidence to invest the money in the space. And you're going to hear this with co-host deals all the time. A landlord doesn't want to invest in their property. Things like design, extra TVs, painting, the furniture, they won't want to do anything with the lawn. It's going to be your job to convince them that there's an upside. So my plan with this is I'm loaning her the beds. She's going to see the increase in revenue because of the body count that she can have. She will either then rent the beds from me or buy them from me. But even if she doesn't, the upside, my 25% on making an extra 100, 200 bucks a night, that 25%, that $50 a night that we get for six months is going to be worth me borrowing her those beds. So at times you might want to decide to put a little money down to make something happen because you'll make enough money even if it's a wash. Returning those mattresses after six months, we can find another home for them. And one of the fun details about this property is how much personal possessions was in here. We've actually packed away personal possessions into the maid closet, into the back of it, where the maids will have access to that room where they can get their supplies. But there's so much stuff in this closet that just did not belong there that of course, again, proof of cats, proof of odd hobbies. And we don't want guests to experience the owner's life. We want the guests to come in with some luggage and act like it's their own. This is the room with the two mattresses. Like I said, let me show you. And as you can see so far, the room has nothing going on. You like my camera stand? Power move, right? I've got some purple, um, headboard panels that you guys saw in a different video. We're going to put there. I'm going to put some end tables here. If I, she doesn't have any, I'm going to go grab some. Uh, there's a vanity right here that she's made. And then of course, obviously there's no bedding. We dropped her off the mattresses and realized she didn't have any stuff. So we're about to put duvet covers and throw blankets and accent pillows and stuff. That's all downstairs. And she has one little piece of art, which I guess we're probably going to put on that wall there. Now I will tell you guys, let me go back to this camera stand. This room does not need to photograph from every single angle. And again, it's just an extra room with some beds. So if from the door, we can have one shot that has the headboard walls and this back wall, and it looks fine, that should be good enough because that's all we need to sell the space. It doesn't need to have art on every single wall. I would like it to have some blackout curtains. We'll see if I want to invest in that or if I can convince her to. What I think can happen in these situations, my friends, if you're going to have landlords give you a property that's their property part-time and you get to like half the time co-host it, you want to show them the money and then from that proof of funds, convince them to reinvest. The easiest time to get somebody to do something is when you put money in their hand. I actually use this with recruitment. Back in my newspaper business, whenever we hired a salesperson, we trained them their first sales job. When we gave them their first check, if it was a good one, we'd ask them if they know anybody else who'd like to try sales. If their check had a comma on it, we got referrals every time. We do the same thing with our housekeepers. So with your co-hosting clients, the moment you show somebody a big month of income, you say, you can make even more if you just listen to me and add some blackout curtains and some plants. 
And this is what I mean about rooms having not much in it. This is the last room. Everything's really low to the ground on this room. We're gonna find a way to make it work. But I wanna circle back to the concept of doing Airbnb with properties when you don't have any backstory, when you don't have any data, any history. That's one of the hardest parts about doing Airbnb is getting a property by getting somebody to trust you. If you buy a property, you're putting your own money down, great, that's your risk. Rental arbitrage is tough enough, getting a landlord to change the way that the property will be inhabited. You're still promising the same rents usually, but the landlord has to trust that you're not gonna break his place. Co-hosting is double danger. They have to trust you not to break his place and that you'll also make money. Because with co-hosting, if you don't make money, they can't sue you and evict you. They just would cancel your contract. There's no way to get money out of you. With rental arbitrage, you're signing a contract to pay and they'll come after you if you don't pay. That's what the landlord thinks. So in this case, I always tell my students, get a property first, an arbitrage or an owned one or whatever, so you can get the data. So you can say, look at my past property, you make a slide deck, show them your performance, your reviews, everything. And then from there, you can pick up more co-hosting deals because you know what you're doing. This type of property is a special instance where somebody has a need, where they only have a temporary need, and they're looking for a quick solution because they travel for work or something. And if you have these people in your network at all or in your network's network, you could be that Airbnb person and they would say, yeah, could you run it while I'm gone? You getting any data, even if this was a three month contract, you could take the three months of data that you have, make that slide deck and go pitch other owners on your performance based on this temporary co-hosting deal. And that really is the hardest part of starting a co-hosting business is getting somebody to trust you. And there's no better way to get trust than with data. I just need to brag on this woman though. Let me show you this room real quick. See if we can get in. Gotta watch out. I've got all these boxes for those headboards that I told you about. Let's get into this room. So she calls this her Zen room. It's kind of a unique space, which is cool. And it's, again, lots of low to the ground stuff, but she had her friend put these little wood panels. This type of room is fashionable more than it is functional, meaning you need good photos on Airbnb. And even though this room doesn't really make a lot of sense, it could have a bed in here, the total net positive of having a room with some style to it, even though the rest of the place is really basic, will add a perceived level of quality, which will increase your nightly rate. This little bit of wood that they put up, maybe 25 bucks, 30 bucks worth of wood, will increase her nightly rate. She did a good job. She also has this little floor mattress here, which um, it's like a single size. That's how she planned on sleeping more people before I talked her into giving up her master bed and letting me put two extra mattresses in here. But with her little floor mattresses and all the extra beds, we can sleep 10 or 11 people. We're gonna find out. And that will of course make more money than if she slept five. It's science or it's math. And look, more plants to water. I'm gonna cheat with these. If you've seen my previous videos about props, you know what I'm about to do. I'm gonna use them in these photos. It's gonna be great. Stay tuned for more videos on my journey with this property and some other houses I'm picking up too, guys. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. You know I'm gonna answer you, right? Love you guys. Thanks for watching this video all the way to the end. You are my favorite people, and I will see you on the other side.